Good afternoon, listeners. We want to let you know that the final episode of About Health aired on Monday, September 9th. If you missed it or would like to listen again, you can find it in KPFA's archives at kpfa.org. As for what's next, stay tuned to find out what new programming will air Mondays at 2 p.m. In the meantime, we invite you to enjoy timeless episodes from KPFA's wide array of thought-provoking content. Thank you for your continued support and happy listening. The following episode will be a sample of the KPFA's Best of Podcast, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts. All you got to do is search for KPFA Radio. KPFA Radio presents A Rude Awakening, a weekly update on climate change and its effects on a local, national, and international level with interviews and commentary. Hosted by Sabrina Jacobs. This show includes interviews with the people and the community that make this global village what it is, from frontline activists to politicians, scientists, and some celebrities. Please enjoy this episode of A Rude Awakening, which previously aired live on KPFA Radio. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to Gabriel Mayangadzi, Program Manager for SAFSI, South African Faith Communities Environment Institute, about the rebranding of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's organization, Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, and their upcoming summit of self-aggrandizement and lies being held in Tanzania. But first, the news. Welcome back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. The latest piece in the Interpress News by Timothy A. Wise entitled Digging Africa Deeper into Hunger, Annual Green Revolution Forum Ignores Widespread Failure of Its Push for Industrial Wise Ray Agriculture and Farmer Organizations are calling on African leaders and the donors who support them to put down the green revolution shovels, climb out of the hole, survey the damage their failing agricultural development model has wrought, and change course to more farmer-centered and sustainable ecological agriculture. And uh, that came out earlier this week. Now, I just want to note that this interview was uh, being recorded or is being recorded ahead of the conference on the 30th. And this is a conference that's being put on by AFSA, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Uh, It's a conference that's entitled No Decisions About Us Without Us. No Decisions About Us Without Us. Leading American Farmer Groups Challenge AGRA Summit Over Corporate dominance. And and, uh, here to talk about it is one of the panelists at that conference. And his name is Gabriel Mayangadzi, and he's the program manager at SAFSI, South African Faith Communities Environment Institute. Gabriel, it has been too long. It is wonderful to have you back on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina, for having me on this show. I'm so thrilled to be back again, and um, we hope to take the discussion that we had last time further. Absolutely. Well, your organization, uh, your coalition of organizations, uh, APSA's coalition of organizations, I I mean, folks have been coming together all across the continent of Africa, and uh, you've been doing so much work and, and doing everything you can to level the playing field. So talk to us about why this conference has been convened by APSA, again, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Go right ahead. Thank you very much for that. Um, The reason why we are convening this is um, the amount of injustice that we see when the issues of the African smallholder farmer is being discussed and it is being discussed without him or with um, an exclusionary fee being posted on this particular conference. We are actually concerned that um, there is very little consultation of the African smallholder farmer on issues that affect him or her directly. 
And uh, this is one thing that we are very much concerned about and would want to offer an opportunity to speak about the alternative, about what should happen, and also to set the record straight in terms of the involvement of those that are affected. And this is why we are saying it is not a complete discussion without us because there is a contribution that we can make, a contribution that would bring a real change and not to offer the temporary solutions that we are getting when we have the gets led um, propositions of farming um, style that is happening now, where we have chemical intensive farming happening in our backyard without us being involved and also without being consulted. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, it's 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 audacious, and it's it's rude and it's not fair at all. It's it's a it's uh, it's egregious to say the least. Because um, how how can there be consultation? You know, how can there be any type of movement in a country that doesn't belong to you? That's not yours without any consultation by the people. I mean, it's just plain and simple there. And, and I, I really, really appreciate the name that uh, AFSA gave the whole conference, you know, no decisions about us without us. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. You know, you and figure show a 34% increase in the number of undernourished Tanzanians, just in just just Tanzania as an example, since 2006. 2006 is when AGRA uh, became what it is. Uh, this uh, so-called uh, um, techno fixer of hunger in Africa. Africa and Africans can feed themselves. Go ahead, Gabriel. Yes. Um, the problem with the whole issues, I think, starting from 2006, is that those that intervened and those that um, decided were those that were not directly affected and they did so without consulting those that are affected and also trying to figure out exactly why is it that people um undernourished maybe that percentage which was there in um 2006 they did not go back to say why are they undernourished of which we, when we look at it closely we actually see that those that cause the problem in the first place are the ones that are trying to resolve it without involving those that are affected. Because in the first place, we have had um, a time when people have been affected by weather conditions, but they were resilient enough to bounce back and be able to feed themselves whenever the weather would improve. But with the kind and with the system that is now in place, it takes away the resilience that people had because people, despite that, would have droughts maybe for a year or for two seasons, people would still have a fallback position because they would have their seed with them, a seed that was well adapted and a seed that um, had been kept within the different families for decades or at times for generations. So it is important that we should look back and say, the people of Africa could, can feed themselves as long as we have the right type of farming taking place in Africa. A farming where people do not become dependent on outside um, seed manufacturers for them to be able to go to the field and plant and have their own um, food. A system where we will have to depend on chemicals that are imported and a system where we would have to um, buy for more and sell for less and a system which does not recognize that there are other crops besides the ones that they are pushing down our throats, which we were dependent upon, those that are nutrient dense and are well adapted to our conditions and systems. And these 
are the ones that have been excluded even from the agra um, um, take of seeds. The ones that are nutrient dense have not been included. And those are also important. And if this recognition that what we use to grow is also part and parcel of our food basket, we would be going somewhere. But right now they've excluded these and the type of agriculture that we are having now of um, lots of chemicals in terms of um, the fertilizers, the pesticides and the herbicides is actually not good for the seeds that we have been using for our millet, for our sorghum, for our rapoko and for all other crops that we used to grow. So without this interference, and maybe with the support on the seeds that we needed, on the crops that we needed, we would be self-sufficient and be able to have our own food and enough to share with others. And mark this word when I'm saying to share, because from our perspective, even when we are selling, we are not selling at a price that is a ripoff like what we are having in terms of the chemicals and the fertilizers that are coming in now, particularly now with the war in um, Russia and Ukraine, prices have gone right through the roof. And even those that were forced to go into this system of agriculture are unable to afford it, which means we are sinking deeper and deeper into the quagmire of the chemical intense type of agriculture that is being forced on us. So we need to be freed so that we are able to feed ourselves. Thank you. Absolutely, most definitely. And it, it's it's a freedom that, uh, you know, at this point is being demanded. You know, it, it's to me being on the outside, you know, being on the periphery, you know, uh, uh, trying to keep a consistent reporting on what's been happening as far as uh, the so-called green revolution that uh, Bill Gates's organization and and the rest of his billionaire friends you know and US taxpayers and and European taxpayers are are buying into or being forced to buy into you know it's like it, it, we you know we don't know we don't know what's going on and we need to to stay abreast of of what is happening so this is wonderful that this conference is happening it's wonderful that this pushback is happening um and and it seems like there's there's three main components to this that you just named um gabriel uh my it's 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 the people that are forced into it right and and now they're in debt to agra and this green revolution it's the, the the monoculture that is ruining the soil um as far as it's only uh, uh the they're only wanting to to plant rice and corn a uh, maize right maize and it's the fact that that these african that the african leaders are allowing this to happen um those are three seem like those, those are the three main components. Are there any other aspects to what is happening that I'm forgetting right now? <laughs> because it's just, it's all around just horrible. It's all, you know, all of it is horrible, but it's important to um, itemize what is going on. It's important to, to, to categorize each segment of how we're, you know, the multifacetedness of this, this uh, assault, this assault on the continent of Africa. Go ahead. Yes, um, maybe you mentioned three, but we can also add the fourth one, which is the forced um, legislation that has actually criminalized the use of um, the indigenous and traditional seeds. I think this comes in as one of the things that we are horrified about because policies are imported and the policies are made by agra technocrats, most of whom are um, schooled in overseas universities and they bring in their doctorates to come and impose laws and policies that do not reflect on 
the other side of farming that does not reflect on the smallholder farmers' needs that actually takes away their right and freedom to choose the kind of seed that they want. And in the end, we are also having the disappearance of the seeds that have sustained the African people over the long um, period. This is the small grain. It is important that we point this out that the kind of policies that governments are being forced to enact and to adopt are only meant to serve the interests of the private companies that are supplying seeds and chemicals to Africa. So it is important, actually, I think part of our pushback is also on the element of seed that we should be allowed to have our own seed and that the governments, as you have already mentioned, are actually colluding with the private sector so that we end up having the seed that we do not want and also being forced to buy seed in each farming season. Whereas in the past, our way of doing things was to keep seed from what we produce so that come the next season, we are not supposed to go into our own pockets for us to be able to grow the crop for the season. But we are supposed to be dependent on our own uh, seed, which is kept, which is also well adapted to the conditions where it is supposed to be grown. Not that which is imported, one which is not as nutrient dense as um, the one that we have locally. So it is very, very important for us to note that the monoculture, as you have already pointed out, is not only harming us as far as our nutrition is concerned, but it goes further to affect the biodiversity in which we are doing our farming. So other than actually targeting the people that are consuming the food, it is also doing greater harm to the environment and to the biodiversity. And it is also one of the greatest contribution to the issue of climate crisis that um, is affecting the whole world and mainly affecting um, Africa. So we are looking at all these components that, that are building up together and that are being deliberately put together to work against the needs and the rights and freedoms of the African farmer. So it is important that we take note that the issue of um, the legislation which criminalizes the use of uncertified seeds, which are um, actually the ones that sustain most of the African smallholder farmers, is something that is hindering, is actually the shovel that has been given to the smallholder farmer to dig himself into the pit. I'm speaking in reference to what Wise actually said in his piece. So it is important for us to ensure that seed is not forced down the throats of the farmers because that is not what they need. And um, we just were also looking at it that as we postulate into the future, what would happen on the day that the private sector that is supplying seeds would decide that there is no more good profit and they would want to shift when all seed is now being manufactured from the laboratory. What would, would happen to the African farmer? Maybe it's a question that nobody has uh, looked at and maybe that uh, Agra has not um, looked at, but what would happen when it is no longer profitable for the seed companies to continue working in Africa? when they would have destroyed our seed. It seems that um, what we are headed for is a disaster for the African farmer and the disaster for the African people because they are being tied to a system that they don't have control over and a system that can actually end with Africa being in a greater disaster than what they are trying to extricate us from. No doubt. Thank you very much. Sabrina. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the voice of Gabriel Mayangadzi, Program Manager at SAFSI, South African Faith Communities Environment 
Institute, and he is a panelist at the uh, conference being put on by Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, uh, that's APSA, and uh, it's entitled No Decisions About Us Without Us. This is Sabrina Jacobs, and we'll be right back after this message from KPFA. KPFA Radio is a community-powered, listener-supported radio station based in Berkeley, California. We are able to bring you this content through donations and support from our listeners. Please consider supporting KPFA through a donation by visiting www.kpfa.org donate. And now let's get back to the program. Welcome back to A Rude Awakening. And uh, Gabrielle, I, I, I am so glad you brought up the legislative part. I wasn't sure if that was something that you wanted to go into, but um, I definitely want to ask you if there's been any type of, through your work, if there's been any type of revelation as to why uh, uh, Agra, I, I guess they've changed their name too. Definitely want to talk about that if we could, could have enough time. Um, they've tried to rebrand themselves, but uh, we'll just call them the Green Revolution people, the Green Revolution idiots. How's that? But um, <laughs> what uh, what is the incentive for these African countries to to buy into this? What is the incentive for these African countries to buy into the destruction of you know, not only the, the land, but the people, the culture, uh, what, you know, who, who would be so absent-minded, so just, just, you know, lost in, in greed to the point where they are willing to, to, to sell all of that off. These legislators and legislators in these African countries why are they willing to do that? What is the incentive? Go ahead. Thank you for bringing that dimension up, uh, Sabrina. You touched that in passing. I think, number one, the element of greed. It actually comes up as one of the things that we see as the factor that has caused most of the leaders to go down this route, which is very destructive to the African um, community in terms of the traditions, in terms of um, uh, the food sovereignty, and also in in, in terms of um, the ability to self-determine the future. When we have a look at it, I think this there is a system of uh, bringing us to this kind of a scenario where you find young people are sponsored to go out and study. And as they go out, they are meant to study things that are not yet in our countries. So because they have gone through the programs and learned about um, genetic modification, they would want to come back and be relevant to our society. So definitely those are the first ones that becomes the front line for Agra to fight the ordinary people in Africa because they would come equipped with their um, MBAs and uh, with their doctorates in, genetic, in, in genetics and they would want to come and demonstrate what they have learned. And therefore, all the policies that we are getting, and this is why I was saying they are actually exported from the universities that they have learned from. So that is the tool that has been used. Educate the young people, make them quite zealous about what they have learned so that they want to apply and um, put it into practice, despite that they have not looked at the context. They have also not uh, had the opportunity to look at the alternative or to look at what has been in existence. Our indigenous knowledge system works well for us. We would want an improvement on what we were already doing in a manner that is that respects the environment. In the past, the African people have had one common thing right across all of Africa. And that is the element of sustainability. Whatever they would use, they would use it in moderation so that the next generation will be able to partake 
of the good that is provided by nature. And this is all gone when we actually apply science, which is learned from outside the environment where it is supposed to be learned. And without also due consideration of what has been happening in the past, without an appreciation of why we are where we are, they just take off and would want to come in and impose things that have not worked well for us. And I think our position is vindicated by the studies that have been done. First, maybe by um, Wise, when he actually did an evaluation and realized that Agra had missed the targets. Later on, we actually have the other uh, evaluation that was done by uh, Mathematica, which also took note of the fact that Agra had missed its headline objectives. And so we are quite vindicated by what has actually happened. The data that is in place shows that our position is the one that is correct, that they never did a good baseline of where we were before they started bringing in this. So the element of greed from our politicians is also another element that is actually ruining us further. Take, for instance, this upcoming um, summit. It is um, prized in such a manner that all the smallholder farmers are unable to attend, paying 350 United States dollars for a person to attend this meeting is out of reach of the most of the small African smallholder farmers and factor in also maybe the flights, accommodation, and all the expenses that are related to traveling for this um, summit. It means already they are excluded. And this is why we are saying there should be no decision for us without us. And this decision, whatever decision they are going to come up with, is not in the interest of the smallholder farmer because the greedy ones are the ones who are sponsored to attend. Most of them, when you would find, are they sponsored by the very beneficiaries of the entire system, which are the seed companies and the fertilizer companies and um, the pesticide companies that are in this particular meeting. And maybe when we look at it, who are the major beneficiaries when we are into this system that AGRA has imposed on Africa. All the research is done by outside um, organizations. The supplies is done by the uh, multinational corporations. What it means is that in itself is already excluded. The only people that are brought in to actually enjoy part of the fruit and also to actually endorse what is happening are the politicians. And they will do it for their personal gain and not for the good of the general person in Africa. And as it stands, this um, summit is endorsing that which is not wrong. Maybe this um, takes me to also want to talk about why did Agra not want to now be associated with the very basic thing that led to the establishment of Agra. They, don't, they do not want to be known as the Green Revolution anymore. Why? They know it is destructive, but they are in there too deep. They can't actually move out. They would not want to acknowledge the mistakes that they have done so that they would have a turnaround and support those that have been feeding Africa for all these generations, who are the smallholder farmer, practicing agriculture in a sustainable manner. And this is our call. Let's have these funders supporting the smallholder farmer to improve on what he has been already doing. Let us have science looking at the information that is already there in terms of the indigenous knowledge systems and improve on what has been happening and not want to reinvent farming in Africa. African food 
has been there and has been thriving under the condition that those that have learned about it over generations have been doing it. There is sufficient knowledge to take us through, but not that which is coming from outside and one which is unrelated to that which is important. And the important thing is to sustain the biodiversity and the environment in Africa. No doubt. No doubt. I, I couldn't have said it better. I, you know, there's just this, uh, again, being on the periphery, being outside, uh, uh, looking in, uh, having never been to Africa, you know, having origins there, but never having never been there, you know, have never, never had the privilege to go. And uh, there is this perspective of, oh, the poor Africans, oh, they're starving, oh, you know, I, I'm probably dating myself, but that, you know, the we are the world uh, the effort and the USA for Africa and, and you know, and, and it's just this, oh, poor Africa. It, 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 now it, it just, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, thank goodness for the internet on a lot of levels, right? And, and other levels, it's pretty annoying. But, you know, because now information gets around quicker. We know what's really going on. It's easy to get the real information about what's happening in Africa and the decimation of the land, of the people, of the culture by Agra. And there's no amount of rebranding that Agra can do, their green revolution. There's no amount of, of covering it up that they can do, you know, at this point, because it is known, the information is out there. And uh, there was there's a great... Uh, um, article tweet us right to know uh stacy mulligan has put the actual documents out there as far as what is happening as far as what the un has been reporting um how this this failed green revolution uh is is showing itself um the numbers are there and they're hosting it in tanzania <laughs> and tanzania has been has been one of the ones uh, one of the countries that has been hurt the most from this and from the so-called green revolution i mean all of the african countries i think it's 13 or 14 of them right gabrielle it's about 13 yes. countries yeah about 11 12 between 12 and 13 but um 13. yeah 13 countries so it's 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 um yeah it's it's mind-boggling it's absolutely mind-boggling and the the greed once again you know it's a global thing um, but I think it's the most egregious in the continent of Africa. What Bill Gates and his cronies are doing, and just the the you know the dangling of that apple from the tree, right, Gabrielle? Of education, it's something that you don't want to deny. It's something that you don't want to deny your children. So of course you're gonna go for it. Of course you're gonna say, oh. Well, my child went to Oxford. My child went to Harvard. My child went to Stanford. My child went to Yale. And they're bringing this back. But with that knowledge, I think the next question is, and I think the question that needs to be posed to the kids that are coming back, coming back to their country, coming back to their home, coming back to their families, is, okay, if you've got that PhD, if you've got that doctor, you've got that master's in genetics or whatever, or uh, advanced farming or techno fixes, then apply it to what you already know, apply it to what your community already knows and has known for, for generations and generations, like you've been saying, Gabrielle, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, okay, if you p apply that knowledge, that, that thousands of years of knowledge with what you're learning in some book somewhere in Europe, in the United States or what have you, you know, mm -hmm. then it, it, they should be able to see that it doesn't compute, right? Mm. I, I, that 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 would be the next question. You know, that's the question I would pose to these kids that are coming back with their their um, their so called degrees. I guess you could say in this case, right? <laughs> but uh, Gabrielle, do you have any last uh, uh, words? We got to go ahead and wrap it up here again, folks. I'm speaking with Gabrielle Mangangadzi. He's a program manager at SAFSI, South African Faith Communities Environment institute of course they're in south africa and uh yeah this uh this is this is all ahead of uh, a conference being put on 
by AFSA, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. And it's entitled, No Decisions About Us Without Us, Leading African Farmer Groups Challenge Agra. I don't think they're called Agra anymore, but whatever. Agra Summit over Corporate Dominance. And this is a corporate, this is a so-called corporate. Uh, they're trying to take over uh, the continent of Africa, <clears throat> the continent of Africa with their techno fixes. Gabrielle, what say you in these last uh, this last minute here? Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I think Sabrina, you hinted on one of the things that um, they take away their legacy in terms of uh, for any organization. You would want your legacy to be remembered. But when a whole organization takes down information that they have accumulated over the years, it means the information is not good enough, it's toxic. And thanks to Stacey for bringing it back to say, this is what they have been doing over the years. Because we need to have that truth so that it would help us to go into the future. Things that are imposed without a thorough study of what has already been in existence are short-lived. And they always say lies have short legs. So we need to also have that put out for all the public to be able to judge. For those that are shareholders in the companies that are bringing so much suffering to Africa, to take stock of themselves, to hold themselves accountable to the kind of disaster that they are bringing to Africa in the name of profits, to ask themselves, is this morally right that they support, that they are part and parcel of the organizations that are bringing suffering packaged as something that is going to um, support Africa? We want assistance, we want support, but the kind of support that we need is that which we are also being involved in. We would want support that leaves us within the element of dignity. We would want support that is honest, support that would bring a benefit, not only short-term benefit, but one that would put humanity on the pedestal of success in the future, not to be short-sighted, not to look at our own generations. They always say we owe the human, our future to the next generation, and we should give it to them that when they also come in, they would find a world that they would be able to do the best for everyone. Let us not only have a look at uh, what it is that which we stand to benefit, but we should look at it fully with the eye that humanity should benefit from all the activities that we are doing. We shouldn't be selfish. We shouldn't be self-centered, but should want to be exemplary in all that we are doing. In Africa, the consideration is that whatever is happening, the entire community is the one that is supposed to benefit. And also the future generation should find our environment in a good state that they are also able to make their lives which are comfortable and leave it for future generations. Sabrina, I would want to challenge those that are supporting the organizations that are bringing this kind of suffering to Africa. As a shareholder in a seed company that does not consider the rights and the freedoms of the people in Africa, are you doing the right thing? Is it morally right? That would be the question that I would want to leave with the people out there. And to Agra, I would also want to ask them a question. Why is it that you are taking away 
the legacy of your organization by removing all the information from your website. If the intention is good, why not admit the mistakes and take a different direction that would actually save the people of, of Africa from the disaster that is looming? Thank you very much, Sabrina. Okay, lions have short legs. <laughs> Gabrielle, I got I gotta use that one. I've got to take that one from you. <laughs> lions have short legs. Exactly. They remove yeah, that's that's the other part. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Gabrielle, it has been an education as usual. Every time I talk to you, it's just it, it, illuminating, illuminating. I tell you, this is um this is something else. So folks, all the information that uh, we've been discussing here, that I've been discussing with Gabriel Magangadzi, Program Manager at SAFSI, South African Faith Communities Environment Institute, um, is going to be on the social media. I will post it onto the KPFA website. It is there. You can see what Bill Cates and his gang uh, are doing how they are ravaging, doing the best they can to ravage the whole continent of Africa. They've only gotten to 13 countries and, and there is a fight ensuing within those 13 countries, right? And that fight starts with knowledge. It starts with truth. Um, as far as morals, Gabrielle, these people do not have morals. Um, along with the, you know, the, the offer of sending their children to get educated in the, uh, the, the Western world, you know, there is the cold, hard cash, right? There is that cold, hard cash that is being offered up. So that uh, supersedes morals on so many different levels. It really, truly does. It's a sad uh, state of affairs, but, you know, that, that, I think that that's, a, that's the other part of it as well. It's the other part of the incentive that um, makes it so easy, so easy for these African leaders to say, hey, that's all right. Legislators they say, hey, it's okay. You know, it, it, that, that, that's all right. We, we, we'll just crush that. We'll just crush a million, you know, a millennia worth of knowledge. <laughs> we'll just go ahead and crush that for your, in, in exchange for your techno fixes. Yeah, it's just um, absolutely sad. Gabrielle and my young Godzi, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Once again, I look forward to speaking with you in the very near future. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina, and thank you for affording us this opportunity to tell the world what is happening in Africa. Thank you. Yes, tell them the truth. Thank you. And now we're going to hear a description of how AGRA has affected some of the communities from panelists at the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa conference that are on the front lines. And this is an excerpt from the conference that was convened on August 30th, ahead of the AGRA summit being held starting on the 5th of September in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And this panel was moderated by Susan Nakakawa of Grain. Then you will hear the voices of Ann Mena of Biba, Kenya, and AFSA, who's been on the show, Juma Shabani, who's a farm leader in Tanzania, and Juliet Nangamba, and she's a part of the Zambian or Zambia Alliance for Agroecology and Biodiversity. Unfortunately, I could not include uh, Mamadou Goita because uh, all of his uh, comments and um, uh, speaking parts, if you would, we're in French, so sorry about that. But let's go ahead and take a listen and uh, hear how Agra has affected these uh, these folks in in their communities. Uh, your question, uh, Susan, the reality on the ground. Um, I come from Kenya, uh, and uh, speaking from that angle is that uh, Agra is headquartered in Kenya, and since its inception in 2016. Uh, with so many huge promises of, for example, uh, dealing with the issue of the chronically undernourished people. You see like the, the 13 countries that AGRA initially was focusing on, there has been an increase of about 50% in hunger. Many may ask, okay, is the hunger because of the current uh, COVID-19 and later the Ukraine crisis that led to the increasing cost of uh, grains, uh, especially wheat? No, by around 2018, already the hunger, the chronic hunger had risen to about 
uh, 31% in the agri focus countries. So you find in terms of reality, after all the promises that had been made and billions are uh, poured into supporting this green revolution model, uh, nothing much has been achieved. My other point is that when you look at uh, some of the criticisms that we as the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa made, especially last year and the year before, writing even to the agri donors and urging a move towards supporting and funding agroecology, what Agra has ended up doing is making some cosmetic changes. For example, they have dropped their Green Revolution name, but still are known as Agra, but still continue to push that model that is more interested uh, in uh, pushing the Green Revolution agenda in Africa by the intense use of uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers and other agro inputs that are mostly a source for, from corporates and the multinationals. At the end of the day, the beneficiary in the agriculture sector becomes the multinationals or the few uh, uh, companies that are working with them. So in reality, you're seeing it's fostering a lot of pro-business and uh, policy changes within Africa governments. Even within the Africa Union, you see changes in our laws, which is something that's very um, serious because once laws are changed and we are promoting uh, a fertilizer subsidy program, which is not sustainable in Africa, the impact on our GDP has been quite huge and the countries are really struggling. And again, as uh, the Alliance of Food Sovereignty in Africa and members here representing the huge uh, Pan-African network, we continue to urge um, the funders that are putting money into the, the AGRA to move the money and support agroecology, where we use local solutions to deal with the hunger crisis and the food crisis in Africa. Thank you. So there are no changes in Kenya. That's what Annie is telling us here. Not Juliet. at all. Juliet, uh, Zambia is the poster child for industry agriculture. In just a minute, is this true? Yeah, uh, I think Zambia has been seen to be one of those countries that have been doing very well in terms of its agriculture sector because it has promoted a lot of what we see as a green revolution. But I also want to paint a picture of what this looks like uh, in Zambia. So despite all this promotion of the green revolution, we still see very long food scarcity periods in our communities. We see increased hunger months in the communities. Some communities are going six months uh, with uh, food scarcity. We see limited access to inputs such as seeds. Seeds have become more expensive and highly controlled. We are still challenged with malnutrition in Zambia. We have 30 to 34% of children who are undernourished due to limited dietary diversity and micronutrient uh, deficiency. This is largely uh, because the model of agriculture promotes a lot of uh, monocultures and we see only maize and now uh, soybeans being grown a lot. We see highly dependent uh, soils and dependent farmers on the fertilizers and hybridized seed. A system of control, and this is limiting uh, a lot of uh, the food sovereignty that the country is supposed to, to enjoy. We have seen women who have become disempowered because they have limited access to resource to produce food for their families because the current model of production uh, doesn't favor women, but it favors men who have uh, uh, access to resources. We also see now a big push for farming blocks, which disempower smallholder farmers, especially women farmers, and turning them only into you know, a, a labor source uh, because they have limited access to, to land. I think um, in the past few years, a lot of our laws are changing, not only in Zambia, but across uh, the continent, especially those laws that have to do with agricultural production, um, uh, seed laws, yeah. Um, thank you, Juliet, for that. And we'll dive straight to Juma, who is based in Tanzania, where the that the, the conference is set to happen in a few days. Juma, yeah, I, what, I does, what do things look like in Tanzania? No, I, I hear you and thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, AGRA in Tanzania has been operating through different projects, at least 17 in the entire country, which focus on um, agro dealer, as, uh, as pastors just said, uh, transformation uh, in terms of uh, transforming 
um, and uh, what they call modernizing agriculture from what they call traditional to more commercial version agribusiness model of agriculture. But also uh, what we see is a uh, uh, change of policies and especially at the national level where we see clearly the manipulation uh, in terms of changing policies, in, in terms of changing legislations on seeds, on land, on markets, and uh, on uh, agro inputs, especially uh, pesticides, fertilizers, to make them more available and distributed. But uh, indeed, that is, uh, that is the way to, to mechanize agriculture and food system in the country through the projects that they operate in the country and also through manipulation of policies and legislations. And indeed now, uh, AGRA has, uh, has, has presented itself as the chief advisor of all policies in the country, in the ministry. And uh, through that, uh, that's why I say it's manipulation of policies. And, uh, and very, very, very clearly, uh, the focus has been in the Southern Highlands where it in this country it is considered as a bread basket and that is where you have a lot of farmers who now have fallen victims of these uh, interventions and of and policies of agra in association with uh, programs like sagcot a southern agricultural growth corridor program but also you've been listening to a rude awakening you can find us on Twitter at Rude KPFA, Instagram, Sabrina Jacobs Radio Host, and Facebook, A Rude Awakening. Tune in to A Rude Awakening Fridays at 8 a.m. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you want to find more KPFA radio content, log on to www.kpfa.org. Also follow us on social media by visiting Facebook at KPFA 94.1 and Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at KPFA Radio. Plus, check out our KPFA TV video content on YouTube and Twitch.tv at KPFA Radio. Subscribe to this podcast and stay updated to when we release episodes of shows representing the best of KPFA Radio. For Pacific Radio, I'm Scott Baba. An Israeli airstrike on a hospital courtyard in the Gaza Strip early today killed at least four people and triggered a fire that swept through a tent camp for people displaced by the war, leaving more than two dozen with severe burns, according to Palestinian medics. The Israeli military said it targeted militants hiding out among civilians without providing evidence. In recent months, it has repeatedly struck crowded shelters and tent camps, alleging that Hamas fighters were using them as staging grounds for attacks. The Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital in the central city of Deir al-Balah was already struggling to treat a large number of wounded from an earlier strike on school-turned-shelter that killed at least 20 people when the early morning airstrike hit and fire engulfed many of the tents. Several secondary explosions could be heard after the initial strike, but it was not immediately clear if they were caused by weapons or fuel tanks. Hospital records showed that four people were killed and 40 wounded. 25 people were transferred to the Nasser Hospital in southern Gaza after suffering severe burns, according to the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital. Israel is still carrying out nearly daily strikes across the Gaza Strip more than a year into the war and has been waging a major ground assault in the north, where it says militants have regrouped. Taiwan's defense ministry says China used 125 military aircraft in exercises aimed at Taiwan, a record for a single day. It says 90 of the aircraft, including warplanes, helicopters, and drones, were spotted within Taiwan's air defense identification zone. China launched large-scale military exercises today aimed at warning against Taiwanese independence. China said the drills were successfully completed as of Monday evening. Taiwan's presidential office called on China to, quote, cease military provocations that undermine regional peace and stability and stop threatening Taiwan's democracy and freedom. China regularly sends military aircraft and ships towards the self-ruled island while also claiming sovereignty over the island. Taiwan, in practice, is self-ruled. 
South Korea has detected signs North Korea is preparing to destroy parts of inter-Korean roads no longer in use as tensions soar between them over North Korea's claim that South Korea flew drones over its territory. Charles de Ledesma reports. Lee Sung Jun, spokesman for the South's Joint Chiefs of Staff, says we think there are possibilities that the North is carrying out space rocket launches, performative destruction of inter-Korean roads, or small-scale provocations. We're preparing to respond to all possible scenarios. Destroying the roads would be in line with the North's leader Kim Jong-un's push to cut off ties with the South, formally cementing it as his country's principal enemy and abandon the North's decades-long objective to seek a peaceful Korean unification. I FEMA paused aid operations in parts of North Carolina over the weekend due to threats against responders fueled by misinformation about storm responses. Ash County Sheriff B. Phil Howe confirmed on Facebook that FEMA suspended in-person aid applications in at least two locations due to, quote, threats occurring in some counties. Aid is expected to resume today. Howe urged residents to remain calm and avoid spreading rumors. On Saturday, operations were also halted in Rutherford County following reports of armed militia threatening FEMA workers, though it's unclear if the threat was credible. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, also known as the Snyder Act, which granted citizenship to all Native Americans born in the United States, as well as voting rights, regardless of tribal affiliation. Catherine Carley reports. Montana Poet Laureate Chris Latre encourages his fellow Native Americans to register and vote. Vote in tribal elections, community elections, state and national elections, every election you can. Guide the future of our people. Still, Latre warns of efforts to suppress their voting. The Montana Supreme Court recently blocked measures designed to limit remote ballot collection on Indian lands. The state has appealed to the Supreme Court. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. I'm Scott Baba for Pacifica Radio. Y acá estamos, luchando con todo el dolor del mundo. Acá estamos. Agua que mata la muerte no se compra con nada. No estamos solos. No estamos solos. Acá estamos. Tantas tierras en el mundo. Tantos mares por nacer. 75 years ago, a revolutionary act launched KPFA. The first listener-supported radio station. Over the years, 94.1 FM has had many labels, including Rebel Airways, because we're an alternative platform for diverse, progressive, and unheard voices. Rebel Airwaves amplified student protest and the civil rights voices. We articulated the Black Panthers' 10-point plan. We presented the voices of Occupy, Black Lives Matter, and Standing Rock. We broadcast demonstrations against all wars. We did our best to guide you through the pandemic with accurate news and public health information. At KPFA, we believe that educating our listeners is not just our mission but the best investment in strengthening our listening community. If that's a rebel act, we're down with that. Join us at kpfa.org. By people who can believe that I was happy on the levee picking cotton, or happy in the mines digging coal, and giving all this away to other people for their wealth, and unable to protect my house, my woman, my children. By people who can believe that I did this out of love for other people, and that I was happy doing it, and that all those songs and dances I learned while I was doing it meant that I was happy. can believe anything. James Baldwin, a voice synonymous with passion, integrity, and vision. 
no other station has been playing voices like these except KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at KPFA.